good morning, or it's good morning for me, Long Beach friends. Uh, we're down here at the church building on Saturday morning, uh, recording announcements and sermon, getting ready for Mother's Day tomorrow, uh, when we'll see each other in our Zoom meeting. That'll be at 10 a.m. as usual. Um, I just wanted to uh, remind you again of our, our topic last week of in times when things are out of our control, how that, that brings us face to face with our dependence on God, how we, we're not able to prepare enough, we're not able to, through our own efforts, resolve everything about the world that we live in, the problems that we face. And it brings us face to face with our dependence on God. And I'll have more to say about that next week, uh, I believe, following on from last week. This week, I want to focus on Mother's Day and, and connect it also with uh, that theme, but in a different way. And before we get to the sermon, though, uh, I, I want to um, show you a, a video that I put together from a number of people in our congregation reading the 23rd Psalm in their different languages. So we'll finish out our announcement time by showing you that 23rd Psalm video, and then we'll get on to our sermon. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Hij laat mij uitrusten in een groene weide en wijst mij de weg langs kabbelende beekjes. Trong nam knyom tui kabai moat tuk, dai ho kung kung. Comfortará mi alma, me guiará por senda de justicia por amor de su nombre. Ni tu uto, bi muti lehen, la ani afuri foji, ojiji ku, Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Ciertamente el bien y la misericordia me seguirán todos los días de mi vida, y en la casa de Jehová moraré por largos días. Amen. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And this is the word of the, of the Lord. Amen. Okay, let's move on into our sermon this morning for Mother's Day, 2020, May 10th. Um, and what I want to start with is reading just the first chapter of the book of Ruth. Uh, it takes place in the time of the judges. There is no king in Israel. Uh, this is after Moses, after Joshua, and in that time when there were judges and there's, there's like Samson and, and, and all that stuff going in, in, through a period of hundreds of years uh, happening in Israel. And Ruth takes place in that setting before the time of, of Samuel uh, and, and leading up into Saul and David. So if you want to put that in terms of um, history, think of Abraham as being roughly 2,000 years before Jesus or 4,000 years ago. Think of Moses as being roughly 1,500 years before Jesus or 3,500 years ago. Right? And then think of David as being about a thousand years before Jesus. And this is taking place between that Moses and David times when the judges were in charge of Israel. And uh, Israel was in the land, uh, but they did not have a, a king over them at this point. Um, David's line had not yet been established. That's the setting for the book of Ruth. So let me read it to you. I'm just gonna read the first chapter. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. 
So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, his wife's name was Naomi, and the names of their two sons were Malan and Kilian. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about 10 years, both Malan and Kilian also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go back each of you to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness if you've shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye and they wept aloud and said to her, we will go back to, with you to your people. But Naomi said, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I'm too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it's more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this, they wept aloud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods, go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with, with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women exclaimed, can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Now, there's a lot more that happens in the book of Ruth. There's three more chapters, um, and we're not gonna get into those. Uh, I, in fact, we're not gonna really get too deeply even into chapter one. I just wanna talk about this from the perspective of Mother's Day and, and, and connect it a little bit to the sort of situation that we're, we face. There's a, a, a few, uh, parts of the background here, I think it's important to point out. Um, first of all, um, the names. The names are significant. In fact, in pretty much all Hebrew literature, names mean, mean, <laughs> names mean something. They always mean something, but they mean something for the story, right? And, and Ruth's husband's name is Elimelech. That means something like, God is my king. And, and Naomi, I, I said Ruth before, Naomi's husband's name is Elimelech. And Elimelech means something like, God is my king. Now, Naomi's name also has a meaning. It means like pleasant or, um, you know, pleasing uh, is, is the, the meaning of it. And, and the reason they leave Israel, the reason they leave Bethlehem, Bethlehem, now Bethlehem probably means something to us as Christians, right? And, and that is important in the story, um, which we won't get into today, but it is important. 
they leave Bethlehem because of a famine. Now in these days, we're talking more than 3,000 years ago, all right? So things were very different. Uh, people were living year to year on agriculture. And if there was a famine, there just wasn't enough food to eat. There's no highway system to bring food from the parts of the world where it's raining or where the weather hasn't been bad. There, there's none of that, right? And so if you live someplace where the, the crops fail uh, and, and you're not powerful enough to secure food for yourself in that place when everyone's trying to get it or there's just not enough, then you go where there is food. And Elimelech and Naomi packed up their two sons and they moved to uh, a neighboring land called Moab. Now Moab is well known in, in Jewish history. Moab is the land and the people that are descended from one of Abraham's relatives, someone whose name you'll recognize. He brought his nephew with him to the promised land. His nephew was Lot. As you remember, Lot settled in Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah did not come to a good end. Lot barely escaped with his two daughters. His wife did not make it. And then the story turned scandalous. Uh, Lot's two daughters uh, find a way to um, seduce their father and they have children by their father. That was scandalous more than 3,000 years ago, the same as it would be scandalous today. His older daughter and Lot are the parents of the people who live in the land of Moab. So Moab is a place of bad reputation for the people of Israel. And for Israelites to leave Bethlehem and go to Moab because of the famine means the famine was bad, right? So they get there and they are basically waiting for whether they should return or not. And Elimelech dies. The two sons, Mary, Moabite women, scandalous. They live there in Moab for 10 years and the sons die. Now, Naomi is the lone Israelite by herself. All the men in her family have passed away, which in these times leaves her in a very precarious position. She's not even in her hometown where she has family to fall back on, but she hears a note of some hope, and that is that the harvest has come back in Israel. And so she decides, I think I should go back home. And so she starts on the way, and the son, the, I'm sorry, the daughters of her two, her two sons come with her. And, and it's, it's like they've just started, and, and Naomi suddenly has second thoughts. She thinks, you know, I shouldn't be taking the two of you with me. I mean, you, you would be coming to a land that's not your own, and, and you would be in the position that I'm in here. So why don't you go back home? You're still young. You can find husbands here in Moab. And I, I wish the best for you. I hope you find a, a, a good home with new husbands. Uh, you know, have a good life. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and and send, tries to send them home. And one of them leaves and the other one does not. And then they have this, this little exchange. Do you think even if I found a husband today and had a baby that you would wait for me to have for my son? That's what Naomi asks the, the daughters-in-law. That's a reference to Leverite law where if a uh, a man died before giving children to his wife, then that man's brother had the responsibility to take his wife as wife and provide children that would be counted as the dead man's children. And so Naomi's thinking, if I had more sons, then they could provide children for you and you would not be alone in the world and your, your family could continue but I don't have any more sons. And even if I had a son tonight, are you gonna wait? 
Now that may seem very strange to us today after more than 3,000 years have passed. Um, our cultures don't work that way, but that's how it was in these days. And the, one of the daughters-in-law goes home and the other one, Ruth, gives that very uh, stirring speech. What does she say? She says, don't tell me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. That's what she says. She says a little more than that, but that's the, the core of it. Ruth is throwing in her life's lot with Naomi. And I found it interesting that when Naomi had told them to go home, she said, go back to your people and your gods. Now, why would Ruth say that? Because in her thinking, God has failed her. Her relationship with God has turned bitter. Somehow, things have soured for her life to be so messed up, so ruined. And she doesn't want to drag these daughters-in-law down with her. And she even says, go back to your gods. So I would say, Ruth is not, a, I'm sorry, Naomi is not exactly in the best spiritual frame of mind, shall we say. She's questioning her relationship with God. She's questioning his goodness towards her. And, and that's just where she is. And Ruth says, no, 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 no. I'm not going back. Your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. I'm with you. Now think about what that means. She's making a serious life choice here. She's deciding to leave her people and go back with Ruth to an unknown place, a place she's never been, an unknown future that Ruth or that Naomi had left because things were bad there. And Ruth is going to stick with her. And in fact, when Naomi gets back and if people recognize her and they're like, oh, this, is that you? Is that you, Naomi? You, the one whose name means pleasant, pleasing? She says, don't call me that. Don't call me that. Uh, call me Mara, she says, because God has made my life bitter. The Almighty has made my life bitter. She says, I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me pleasant? Why call me pleasing? Yahweh has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. And that's where things might well connect with the kind of situation that we face, where we, we hear about bad things happening around us and bad things happen to us. Uh, people get sick, they die, businesses are hurt or ruined, um, and the future is uncertain. It's not like we're in a famine, we're in a pestilence. <laughs> we're, we're in a pandemic. Uh, and, and that's what we're dealing with. And, and, and Naomi, in her, her hurt heart, is questioning God when they go back. Now, you'll probably want to read the rest of the story. Read the rest of, of Ruth if you want to hear how the book turns out. Um, I, I can spoil it for you. <laughs> they go back. To make, to make a long story short, they go back. Naomi reconnects with some of her family. Uh, one of her family members marries Ruth and uh, takes her to be his wife, and they're rescued. And the family member, Boaz and Ruth, have a boy. That boy turns out to be David's great-grandfather. No, no, no. Ruth turns out to be David's great-grandmother. The boy is his grandfather. I think that's right. <laughs> now that I'm trying to tell you, I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. So let's, let's think about this for a minute. 
Unexpected, unwanted circumstances. Famine, going to Moab, scandalous. <laughs> Loss of, of loved ones, no wonder Naomi is bitter. But while all this has happened, she's made an impression upon Ruth. There's something about being one of God's people that has impressed Ruth. And Ruth is not prepared to leave her. And in fact, Ruth is prepared to say in the face of all these things, your God will be my God. And, and, and let's, let's just look at what happens in the rest of Ruth. Naomi offers advice to Ruth. She connects her with her family. Um, she's a good friend. She's a confidant. And Ruth is adopted into Naomi's family through Boaz and, and becomes the great-grandmother of David. Okay. So what I would say about Naomi is that she is the spiritual mother of Ruth. And it's interesting how even in the middle of a low point in her life, when it looks like things are going poorly and Naomi is bitter, God strengthens this relationship with Ruth, takes them back to Bethlehem, cares for them, and through them, David, the one who is the ancestor of Jesus, is born into the kingdom of Israel. She is a spiritual mother to Ruth. Now, think about that word, spiritual mother. What comes to mind when you hear that word? All through the history of Christianity, there have been spiritual mothers. Sometimes it's the same as the biological mother. In fact, I, I think that's generally this, the way God has designed the family, that biological mothers are the spiritual mothers of their children. But not necessarily exclusively. We don't know what Ruth's biological mother was like. Maybe she was a fine mother. But Naomi brought Ruth to her God, Yahweh. And that was the defining thing about the rest of Ruth's life. And she cared for her. There are other spiritual mothers mentioned, even in, even in the scripture. Uh, you could think of uh, Elizabeth and Mary, where Elizabeth is not Mary's biological mother, but Elizabeth takes Mary in when Mary comes to visit her after the angel Gabriel tells her she's going to be pregnant, and she is. And even though Mary is not married, Elizabeth cares for her. And Elizabeth recognizes what's going on in her. And God uses Elizabeth to guide Mary through those first three months of being pregnant before she goes back home. A spiritual mother. Paul mentions at the end of the, the letter to the church in Rome, he talks about how Rufus's mother is his mother, <laughs> was his mother, a spiritual mother. Uh, and, and you see those kind of relationships all through scripture. Um, that is the pattern of God using mothering to make people the disciples of Jesus, to make people followers of Jesus, to make them followers of God. That's what happens with Ruth, right? She says, your God will be my God. Now, I don't think that Naomi shared with her the four spiritual laws or, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. I think what happened was they shared life together and Naomi lived as a person of God even when she was not so sure about God. And Ruth noticed, and Ruth watched, and Ruth said, that's what I want. That's where I'm gonna put the hope of my life. Even at a time 
when Naomi was low, was just not feeling it, was feeling abandoned by God. And this Moabite woman, Ruth, sticks with her, maybe even giving her a reason to live. And God had all that in his design for Naomi and worked through her life to bring Ruth into his people uh, and even into his plan of redemption for the whole human race. That's kind of an amazing thing. So think of it, a spiritual mothering. It's like, it, it's, it's following Jesus as a woman where other people can see you. Now, it's not just that spiritual mothers are mothers to women. They're mothers to men also, like Paul, Paul mentions. They have those loving relationships, those showing the characteristics of God in the way that they interact, being his instrument that draws people to him. There's, there's teaching, there's advice, there's sharing resources, there's friendship, there's giving instructions, but most of all, they're setting an example. That's what makes spiritual mothering. Now, you know, I feel funny saying that because I'm a guy, right? I'm a, I'm a male. I will not be a mother, right? But judging from Scripture, judging from my experience of ladies who have spoken into my life, who have been spiritual mothers to me, that happens. That's a real thing. It's a vital thing. I can tell you many more stories, but that's really what I want to focus on today, of, 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 of celebrating this whole idea that God has made in his image, man and woman, male and female, in his image. He has created us to multiply and make more people who follow him. And being a mother, a biological mother, a spiritual mother, is part of that. To be a spiritual mother, you don't have to be a biological mother. You don't even have to be married. You don't have to be old. You just have to be a woman who allows the image of God to come, out, come forth, to be present in the world around her, for people to see that, to experience that, to love people the way God loves us, to guide people the way God guides you, to share life together under God, and that draws people towards him. Now, I don't mean to minimize the idea of teaching or instruction. Those are part of it. Those are an important part of it. Uh, we do communicate those things. But all those things together, that life fitting together under God, lived out in a way that where as you are more senior as a woman, to other women who are more junior, spiritually, in their spiritual maturity, in their age, whatever it is, and you, you give of yourself to them in that way that Jesus laid down his life. And I think that happens, frankly, more often through women than men. I think there's something about the way God made women where they're just more like him in that way. And that's a great thing. And that's what we celebrate on Mother's Day. And that's what we want to celebrate today. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, uh, we are thankful that you have given us mothers. And we celebrate that on Mother's Day. And we are thankful for it every day. Uh, guide us through this day that we would honor those who have been spiritual mothers to us. Uh, we are your people. We are the church. We, we, we know that you've called us to honor our biological mothers. We know that we should honor those who are our, our spiritual mothers. And we pray that this would be a day of that, that we would be your people, you would be our God, and that you would encourage us, that you would inspire us as your people to be the people you created us to be, and especially in the area of mothering today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Now, uh, next we're going to be getting into a, a video that is uh, pictures, uh, a few messages for different mothers in the church, uh, some videos uh, celebrating Mother's Day. So we'll get to that next. Thanks. wife and mother. I am so grateful to be sharing my life and parenthood with someone so loving and caring as you. Again, thank you very much for taking care of everything at home while I was away in the last two years. And to all the moms, happy Mother's Day. Thank you for the surprise last week um, with the food and the mask and the gifts. We love you so much. You are the glue to your families. And I would hope that your husbands and kids would all agree. Thank you. Happy Mother's Day, Matt. We love you. And oh, Mother!